In the spring of 1942, the American Pacific Fleet is beginning to recover from the beating it took at Pearl Harbor. None of the Navy's seven aircraft carriers were in Japanese bomb sites on December 7, 1941. In the months that followed, carriers engaged in hit-and-run attacks on enemy bases. Early in May, an enemy force led by three carriers is making an end run around New Guinea to capture Port Moresby. If they succeed, they will have a springboard to invade Australia. To stop the oncoming enemy, a U.S. force moves into the Coral Sea, spearheaded by the carriers Yorktown and Lexington. The result is the Navy's first major fleet engagement of the century. For naval historians, this is a first. The first sea battle in history in which the opposing surface forces never come within sight of one another. The Lexington's fighter squadron commander, now retired Vice Admiral Paul Ramsey, remembers this battle. Of course, we didn't see each other except by uh, air. We didn't see, the surface forces didn't see each other. In most sea battles, normally the opposing forces are inside of each other. In this particular case, they were anywhere from uh, 300 miles to 100 miles away. We made attacks on them and did some damage, which at that time we didn't know, but we caused quite a lot of havoc. In the meantime, the Japanese had attacked the Lexington and the Yorktown. They put one bomb in the Yorktown flight deck, which did not uh, severely uh, handicap her for landing operations and takeoffs. But the Lexington had received three hits. My squadron, we had uh, been gone so long, I said, we just don't have fuel enough to get to Yorktown, it's better to land on a flaming deck, hoping to put the fire out than to land in the ocean and lose all our aircraft. So they let us land aboard the ship. No fire pressure on any of the hoses throughout the ship, which was just devastating. And so after, uh, oh, maybe two and a half or three hours, it uh, got so bad that uh, uh, the skipper said to abandon ship. The Lexington sank during the night with her battle flag flying also sunk an American destroyer and an oiler. Japan loses a carrier and a second is damaged. Who won? In the view of Captain Ted Tuleha, naval historian, although they sank more of our ships, they did not get Port Moresby, which was the essential aim of their war plan. So the aircraft carrier uh, involved in, in this battle proved to be the essential instrument. Yet there was another test that was required, whether a, an entire fleet could be knocked out because of the presence of air power. The Navy prepares for the inevitable next test. New Navy pilots are being trained by the thousands. Shipyards work around the clock. But time is running out. On the staff of Admiral Chester Nimitz, Pacific Commander, a team of code breakers has untangled a mass of enemy radio messages. They contain grim news. Early in June, hardly a month after the Battle of the Coral Sea and 5,000 miles to the north, Admiral Yamamoto plans a massive attack on Midway Island, a strategic American outpost. His objectives are to secure an advanced base for new all-out attacks on Pearl Harbor and to lure the remnants of our Pacific fleet to annihilation. The odds are overwhelming. Admiral Nimitz has no battleships against Yamamoto's nine. Only eight cruisers against 15. Facing four Japanese carriers, the Hornet, Enterprise, and hastily repaired Yorktown but we have the advantage of knowing Yamamoto's plan. Reinforcements are flown into the Midway-based squadrons. The battle commanders, Rear Admirals Frank Jack Fletcher and Raymond Spruance, place their three carriers in wait north of Midway. Wade McCluskey, then commander of the Enterprise Air Group, now a retired Rear Admiral, remembers how it started for him. I was called into Admiral Spruance's cabin, and he told me then it could be a turning point because we had very few ships left. 
So if this was going to be a major battle and we were defeated, well, that meant the end of the war, practically. Then at, well, it was 8 o'clock before we actually got a report of the Japanese striking force, which included their carriers. And uh, then, then it became uh, our time to take off. Fiercely, unflinching, knowing the stakes, eight waves of our airmen go after the Japanese fleet, dive bombers, torpedo planes, and fighters. The American carrier pilots, with the odds stacked high against them, will score an incredible victory. About five after 12, using binoculars, and I was still at 19,000 feet, I discovered straight ahead about 30 miles of Japanese striking force. Unaware of the nearby American carriers, the Japanese are caught at a great disadvantage. In the sights of our dive bombers as they scream out of the sky, are Japanese flight decks packed with airplanes and high explosive bombs. The Japanese pay a heavy price. When the Holocaust ends, their four carriers with their planes and a cruiser are at the bottom. What makes Midway so distinctive in contrast to the Coral Sea is that it was a decisive battle. Uh, clearly, this was the end of uh, the beginning of the end of Japanese naval power in the Pacific. But we also pay a price. Our carrier Yorktown is lost and more than a hundred airplanes put out of action. We had terrible disasters and uh, I think particularly with our torpedo planes. These uh, were really old fashioned types of aircraft to engage in a, a modern battle and uh, the torpedo squadrons which took off from the three carriers we had available uh, got slaughtered. One was wiped out completely. This was uh, Torpedo Squadron 8 under the command of uh, John Waldron. Uh, there was one survivor, his plane crashed, but he was fished out of the sea a little later. The one survivor of Torpedo 8 at Midway is George Gay, today an airline pilot. Most of us were brand new ensigns right out of training. When we got to Midway and were to make our takeoff, it was the first time we'd ever carried a torpedo, pickle as we called them. We just went into the fleet, tried to get around the, the, the destroyers and then the cruisers and things to take whatever came first as a target. They had about 75 airplanes down there trying to eat us up and we only had 15, so we didn't last very long. I was tail end Charlie, last aircraft in the whole formation. And I was kind of sitting back here watching this whole thing. I made my attack on this carrier and I somehow got in close enough to drop my torpedo and get through. I couldn't use this hand. I had a bullet in here and one in this arm. The zeros jumped on me again out on the other side and shot me down. So when I came back to the surface, bumped into my life raft. Also, this black cushion. I didn't want them to pick me up. So I put this cushion over my head, and I would turn this sideways to any ship or anything that was close, and I could watch them out of the corner. I'd see through this thing. They were looking at me with binoculars, but they'd see this thing and assume that it was a box or a piece of debris or something, rather than my head bobbing up out there, and they passed me up. I was able to stay there all day, even though they were picking people up all over the place. I'm sitting right in the front row here of this big battle. I saw our dive bombers come in and knew all those boys too, and I knew that uh, this was their first dive, not only uh, with a bomb aboard, but in that airplane. So I was just cheering like a football game. A PBY came by, landed on the water, and picked me up in this PBY took me into Midway. I lost about 24 pounds during that time. When I got down to Pearl Harbor and the Admiral came in, Admiral Nimitz, he said uh, he wanted to know about it. A fisheye view and a front row seat to the biggest naval battle in history. Uh, well, I'm kind of proud of that. I don't want to go through it again just to lose 24 pounds, but uh, it was uh, something to remember. A grateful nation comes to idolize these flyers who can leave their mobile airstrip with no assurance it will be afloat to come home to. In all their jokes, they laugh off the mortal danger of their trade. 
One pilot, amid the chaos of an aerial dogfight, radios to his squadron. Buy war bonds. Somebody's got to pay for all these fireworks. Another, overwhelmed by zeros, radios his ship. I've got four already and 30 more cornered. The deck crews scoffingly call the flyers Airedales, but worship them. The flyers make no secret of their own respect for the deck crews. I trusted the man that put that aircraft under me, and I think that's a supreme compliment you can pay somebody. The enlisted man, whether he's the man in your squadron or whether he's a shipboard deck handler, the man that unhooks your tail hook, the man that uh, catapults you, or the man that moves you between planes. Gene Valencia. My plane captain was 19 years old, 18 years old, Sammy Belt from the Essex. And I just have to ask him, is the plane ready to fly? One subject is strictly taboo. In the wardroom, after a mission, as they count empty chairs, their only comment is bleeding silence. The one thing that I've tried to keep with me when I lost friends, uh, my fellow pilots, uh, and pilots that I didn't know so well in my various commands, was that that individual was doing something that he loved. By mid-1942, a little brother of the attack carrier begins to come off the ways in increasing numbers. The escort carrier, nicknamed Baby Flat Top or Jeep Carrier, is about a third the size of an attack carrier. Carrying only 30 planes apiece, they give support in troop landings and also play a key role in hunter-killer groups that roam the mid-Atlantic to fight wolf packs of German submarines that are cutting the lifeline to England. Dan Gallery, now a retired rear admiral, commanded a jeep carrier in the Atlantic. For one long period, we were losing over half a million tons of ships per month. Altogether, we lost several thousand ships. The uh, shore-based airplanes we had early in the war were not uh, long enough range to reach all the way across the Atlantic. And so there was a so-called uh, mid-ocean gap. Our CVEs came along and uh, closed that gap up. When they did, the, the CVEs uh, really made a shambles of the sub-fleet. In this bizarre war between birds and fish, the jeep carrier Guadalcanal manages to capture a whole live submarine. We took it in tow and brought it home, and incidentally, it's now parked at the Museum of Science and Industry in uh, Chicago. In the Pacific, both sides.